Sunday night edition of the Crash the Pond podcast. Jake, we finally have major news to talk about. Major major national major nationwide news that major? broke yesterday. Major Saturday, news. Saturday, November 7th. Wow. Uh, this was a big one. This was a big one. A lot of people were talking about this. Um, Jamie Drysdale signs his entry-level contract. It was the biggest news on Saturday, for sure. Um, can't think of anything else that people would have been talking about. So, How big of a dad a joke was that? How big of a dad joke was that? How big of a groan did everyone out there have at Felix doing that right there? How big of a groan? What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> What do you mean? What, what, uh, what, what's this? What's this negativity? I don't. I don't like this. No negativity from me. None. None. None here. Just you know, maybe maybe some very consequential news happened yesterday that that I you're making I light of. I can't think of any. Honestly, <laughs> I can't think of any. Um, Jamie Drysdale though, he's locked up, signed his three-year entry-level deal, and during this week that just was Jacob Pro also I mean that was the other big news of the week honestly those are the two biggest items uh, nationwide uh, was Jacob Pro and Jamie Drysdale both signing their entry level contracts so the Ducks lock up their two first round picks of the 2020 draft and still we probably won't be seeing them play in the NHL for a little while yeah probably not going to be a couple years for both of them and that we'll we'll get to that a little bit in uh in a minute or two when we talk about uh, one of the questions we actually Mm -hmm. got from a listener to the show that they wanted answered on this show. But um, really quick, let's jump into the contracts though. Cause they're, I mean, they're pretty standard issue, but they are slightly different between the two of them. Um, Jacob Mm -hmm. Perot signed a three. So they're both three year entry level contracts with a cap hit for both of them of $925,000. Both of them got um, signing bonuses of $92,500. So basically what that means is in terms of hard money, they both got paid uh, uh, um, $92,500 right basically when they sign the dotted line. And that will continue for the next two years. If there are entry-level slides, then they won't get paid those for those remainder years that kind of get tacked on at the end. The biggest difference between the two deals is the fact that actually um, Jamie Drysdale's AAV is higher then uh then Jacob Perot so the cap hit for both of them is going to be $925,000 yeah $925,000 but the biggest difference is the potential earnings for uh Jamie Drysdale is a fair amount higher because he has performance bonuses that typically come with being a top 10 pick if you look at Trevor Zegras's contract he has a very similar structured contract where they both have $850,000 um, in terms of potential bonuses and performance bonuses. So if they hit certain milestones, they're typically like you win rookie of the year, you play in a certain amount of games, the, these kind of standard type of de- um, benchmarks that you're supposed to hit um, when the contract comes into play, there are bonuses that are associated with that. And so those will only be tacked on though on the cap hit if they meet those. So those are potential. They're not necessarily going to be there. Jacob Perot does not actually have any of those. So that's the biggest difference, and it makes sense. That's the difference between being a top ten pick and just a late first round pick. Is that, um, and that's the that's honestly the biggest difference between the two of them. But one thing I want to note because there were some people kind of asking, well, what's the what does this mean? What does this do for the team? Does this mean they're going to be playing for the team? All this different type of stuff. So them both of those players signing this contract does not actually mean that they're going to be with the Ducks this year. And I think that's a, a key point to make here. Um, guys that play in the CHL, they can sign their co- NHL contract whenever they want because they are not technically amateur players. They can go back and play in the Canadian Hockey League with having signed this contract. The only thing that this means is that they have the potential to make the Ducks now. Not necessarily that they're going to, but they have the potential to. They cannot play in the AHL still because they're playing in the CHL. So that's kind of the biggest uh, biggest thing to take away from this is that they could potentially play in the NHL, but there's not really a whole lot. Really, we're signing the ELC as a big deal, and, and this is kind of where I would read into it and where you actually have to read into it is if it was a college player like a Trevor Zegras. When Trevor Zegras signs his ELC, that means he is coming to the NHL or the AHL. He is leaving college because once you sign your NHL contract, you are no longer eligible to play in the NCAA. So that is where signing the ELC is a major, major deal. For Drysdale and Perot, obviously it matters. They're now under contract with the Ducks. They're locked in. They're going to be Ducks no matter what. But that's pretty standard issue for guys playing the CHL. So I wouldn't read too much into this if you're a Ducks fan that these guys are going to make the NHL this upcoming season. This is just kind of standard issue 
uh, standard issue type of situation where you have a guy playing a CHL sign his ELC. Obviously, congratulations to them. Congratulations on getting this contract, especially Drysdale getting one with the performance bonuses we talked about. But don't read into it too much with these ones. Right. It, it, it both signifies, hey, these guys are players of certain status. This is what happens when you achieve, like you talked about, a first round selection. But at the end of the day for the Ducks, it doesn't mean a whole lot for next season and potentially even the next couple of seasons. One thing I did want to point out that is completely unrelated to what you just discussed. And go for it. I, I don't I don't mean to take this off script, but on Trevor Zegras's cap friendly page, Notice that it says Trevor Zegras number 52 now. Interesting. Yes, it, it does. It, it, ha- it has a jersey number. And this is something that we actually talked about, I think, either on a Patreon episode or on a... I mean, I, it, may, it all blends they're, together. They're all blending together at this point. We, we found it on the Ducks website. Didn't we see that he was 52 on the Ducks website? Yes, we, we've, we've seen that before. And so clearly... Well, probably the cap friendly site is scraping their roster information from the the team sites or the NHL site or whatever. So there you go, Trevor Zegras number fifty two. I mean, I don't I don't know if that's going to hold, but for right now, that's what he's slated to wear. So uh, get your Zegras fifty two uh, customizations uh, on wherever you order your jerseys from uh, teed up because you could you could be in early on this one. Yeah, the only spot actually where I believe, and this is something, do not quote me on this. But where I believe this them signing these contracts matter is the amount of contracts you're allowed to have uh, signed um, to players. And so the Ducks are now actually close to the 50 contract limit. They are at okay. 49 contracts. So if I'm understanding that correctly, and I think I am actually, and this is something I hadn't really thought about till right now as I was thinking this through, Ducks can only sign one more player than they have in their system. Or um, mm-hmm. if they go over that, they're over the 50 contract limit and would have to move a contract out um, in order to be compliant with the NHL. And that's that's actually something I hadn't really thought about, but it is it, it's important. You have to be under the 50. You have to be at or under the 50 contract limit um, to be compliant with the NHL rules. And so, if the Ducks were to go and sign a backup goalie, they're at the 50 contract limit. Well, doesn't this kind of confirm that Anthony Stolarz will be the backup goalie? Probably. I mean, you're yes, I, I would say more or less. But it also kind of confirms that the Ducks don't really have the space to go out and not only cap space, but contract limit, <laughs> limit space to go out and sign a bunch of guys. They, they're they more in the category of you got to move some contracts out to make things work, not only salary cap wise, but contract limit wise. That That's something where... I don't think the Ducks have ever been in this situation. And maybe it's just simply because um, we don't really pay attention to the contract limit as much. But this Mm -hmm. maybe we're getting in a situation where we should be. It is interesting. Um, What I would say, though, with uh, I mean, it, it all just kind of confirms what we've been saying for a while, though, right? That the Ducks are kind of all in on this current group that they've put together. And like you said, there's just another another data point to go off of, of, of how they're pretty much locked into this roster for next season. Yep. Um, the season, the season after that will change significantly with some notable names hitting free agency. But for right now, the, what you're looking at is what you're going to get for the ducks next season. Yeah. And real quick, I want to touch on this cause it, it's relevant to the point of the Drysdale and pro contracts. Ken Pafum also want to shout out Ken Pafum and Heyo Deflo just resubbed um, on, to our Twitch channel. So shout out to both of you for doing that. Really uh, good listeners of the show, active in our Discord of our Patreon. So thank you guys so much for supporting us, not only here, but also on Patreon. Ken Pafu asked, mm-hmm. though, uh, with those two signing their ELCs, do the years still count or do they only count while they're playing for the NHL? So basically the way it works is the the entry level slide. And that's the biggest thing to understand here. Um, out of all of this. And so an entry level slide slide is basically when you're under 20 years old, if you are have not, and this is where the, the 10 game limit always comes into play. Um, and, and this is where you hear a lot of guys talk about that. The, the 10 game limit is because if you've played those 10 games that year does not count as, or that year does count as an entry level, uh, slide. And so here's the actual wording. This is from cap friendly. If a player who is signed to an entry level contract and is 18 or 19 years of age, as of September 15th of the signing year does not play in a minimum of 10 NHL games. So if you played in under 10 NHL games, 
um, including both regular season and playoffs, AHL games do not count. Their contract is considered to slide or extend by one year. And so basically, if Jamie Drysdale does not play in 10 NHL games this season or 10 NHL games next season, his contract will have slide or slid for two years. So the first year of his deal will not will be not this season, not next season, but the season after in that situation. And same thing with Jacob Perot. Mm-hmm. And that same thing applies to guys playing in the AHL. So if uh, Trevor Zegras were to play all year in the AHL and only play play under 10 games in the NHL this upcoming year, his entry level deal will also would also slide in that situation. And so that's a key thing. And that's why we're saying signing the contract doesn't really matter that much because these guys are probably going to go back to the CHL. This contract's going to slide that year. This year is not going to count as a year off that contract. The only, the only little seed of doubt, and this is very tiny, but the OHL is the, is the only league in the CHL that has, kind of had a rocky start in deciding it's it's season the way it's they're going to go about playing their season right there was the whole yeah there there was the whole drama surrounding the health minister talking about no body checking so that's the only league where there seems to be question marks the qmjhl despite the the rocky road that they've been on they're still playing games and i think the whl we just haven't heard as much about there hasn't been the kind of drama there I, w- I would suspect if that happens, they'll probably play in the AHL. Um, so mm-hmm. the reason why they're not eligible to play in the AHL, and, and this is now just really getting into the the deep waters of, of contracts yes. and talks and things like that. Yes. But, I mean, we got nothing better to talk about right now, and they just <laughs> signed their contracts. Um, but it, it's, a de- it's a contract essentially between the CHL, all the three branches of the CHL, and the AHL, NHL. And basically what it is is the fact that these guys, if they are on a CHL team, they are not eligible to play in the AHL until their CHL season is over. So once their CHL, whether in the WHL, OHL, QMJHL, once that season is over, playoffs are done for that for their team, they're eligible to actually go to the AHL. So for instance, Jamie Drysdale, let's say the OHL happens. Let's say the Erie Otters get eliminated or don't make the playoffs. The AHL is still going. He's actually eligible to go and play in the AHL, and he would just have to go back to junior to to Erie next season and couldn't play in the AHL Mm -hmm. at the start of next season. So what I would suspect that would happen is if the OHL doesn't end up happening, if the WHL doesn't end up happening, all of those players would probably just go to the AHL or maybe even the ECHL or something like that. If that happens, Europe, maybe, maybe go to Europe. Who knows? There's a whole lot of options Mm -hmm. that, and a whole lot of things that could happen, but Basically, there's going to be a spot for these guys to play um, no matter what. It's just where that's going to happen. And so maybe, honestly, that's a big reason why. And now, granted, we're reading into this too much when we said not to. Maybe that's the reason why Drysdale and Perot signed their deals. I mean, it's pretty run-of-the-mill that they signed them, but maybe there is some worry about whether Junior will happen and this allows them to play in the AHL. But um, Yeah, I, I just I wouldn't go that far. And I know you're just kind of... I'm spitballing. You're just thinking out loud. Yeah, yeah, but but I would just add to that because I know there are people who maybe have thought that, and this is just this is very much status quo. Yeah, one hundred percent. First round picks get signed to ELCs shortly after yeah, the draft, and I would even argue that their ELC came a little longer than I would have expected because usually it happens pretty quickly. Yeah. So, yeah, not a whole lot there to read into. Nope. And real quick, um, just because people are kind of asking these types of questions, can Pafu ask, do they still get paid? for the sub 10 game season. So the way NHL players actually get paid is on a per game basis, I believe, or maybe it's per day. I forget that they're on the active roster. So they will get, if they are playing in those sub 10 games, they're going to get paid the amount that they should for those days based upon their, uh, their going rate based upon their, their NHL salary per day or per game. I believe it's per, per day on the roster is how it works though. Um, and, and then it will just slide. So they're only going to be paid for the amount of games that they are actually on that roster. So it's not as if they're getting paid five years of this contract when they only have three years actually count. Um, it slides because they are not on the roster for that long. And that that's kind of how that works. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I think that that's so, kind of a fair amount of a in-depth review yeah, of the, the Perot and, I, and Drysdale I, uh, contracts. I applaud you. You really, you really dove deep in there into those details, which are important, by the way, hey, not to not to make light of those by any means. That's what I'm and, known for here. 
one thing I would add just big picture wise is that this is just kind of another step in the Ducks progression here in terms of the next wave, right? Getting these high end picks signed and, and locked in, although it's something that we expect that's part of the status quo. This is just another step forward for the Ducks. These are the guys that we're going to be following and watching for the next few years following their development and for the Ducks, they're hoping that they turn into difference makers because they really need them to become that since the Ducks didn't opt for a Marco Rossi type, let's say, at six. And they, at 27 with Perot, definitely went for upside, but they need to hit on these guys so that they can really someday move on from their the current era that they're in. Yeah. So let, let's get into this question. So we got a bunch of questions that we'll get into in Twitch chat. We'll get to more yep. of your questions later on in the show. Hold them until then and then uh, throw them in when I kind of mention that we're about to get to it. But Alex9000 uh, on Twitter, at Sith, Sith Lord Buscemi, said, heard a lot of projections on when we'll see Drysdale with the Ducks, but when do you think Perot will make the jump to the Ducks? That is a tough one <clears throat> because I think with Drysdale, he's not – there's definitely an element of his game that does need to come around to be ready for the NHL. I think he's already a good enough skater. I think he already has the instincts offensively, but really his defensive game is going to need some work. You could almost cut and paste all of that for Jacob Perot, except Perot doesn't have the speed and the, the kind of uh, elegance of a Jamie Drysdale, the way that he skates. I think Perot's skating might even be a little underrated, but being, I guess, somewhat on the smaller side, I mean, he's 5'11", which probably means he's a little shorter than that, 192. He's already got a pretty good pro frame, but I think he's he's going to need a little time as well. I would honestly put them on similar timelines, you know, two to three years. Yeah, I, I would say maybe even a little bit longer for Perot. Um, I, I think that he's a guy that it just depends. Yeah. I think he's a guy that maybe once his time in the in juniors is done, he'll probably need a year or two in the AHL to really develop his game. I mean, that's kind of what we've honestly seen from these late first round picks that the Ducks have been having of late. And now maybe Perot has higher end skill than some of them. But I mean, you look at Comtois, you look at you look at Jones, you look he at Steele. Yes, they all needed about a year, at least a year or so in in the AHL. And so I would expect. Perot will probably need a year or two in the AHL before well, he's so able to make the jump. Just to just to clarify, Contois was a second rounder, so correct, correct. But late he was, second rounder, correct. Fair um, enough. But but so the point, but the thing with Perot though that I think the reason why I wouldn't lump him into that group is because Perot already has an elite offensive skill set. Fair enough. I would argue elite. Maybe some people don't see it as elite, but I think enough people do. Enough smart people do. The people that I trust, right? He's got that elite shot. He's got a good offensive toolkit. He already has something that translates to the NHL, and it's just how quickly can he get it to show once he gets into those games. And so if he has a training camp, probably not, definitely not this year, but let's say in the next couple of years where he just goes off and then has a hot streak, right? And the Ducks the, the Ducks could just decide to keep him on. It's yeah, not... It could be... Ne I mean, honestly, it could be this season. I, I doubt that it will happen. The type of... The, the type of player he is, it leaves open that possibility yes. is all I'm saying. Yeah, because these guys, j that's one thing to note. Jacob Perot and Jamie Drysdale are also eligible. To, I mean, we have no idea how a training camp is actually going to be this year <laughs> and what it's going to look right. like, but they are eligible to be at training camp uh, now. I believe that they are. I believe even if they didn't sign their ELC, they would have been eligible. But regardless, they will now for sure be at training camp. And I mean, if they impress, who knows what happens, but more likely than not, they're not going to, they're probably in the sense of impressing enough to make a roster spot and be sent I, back to junior. I, I'm going to make a bold prediction. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how much of training camp we're actually going to be able to view <laughs> this year. I, I don't know how, how the ducks are going to do it, what that's going to be like, but I think they're going to stick out like a sore thumb in a good way in these training camp games, scrimmages and, and drills, because and in a good way, it's, it's, I guess sort them as a negative con connotation, but I think they're really going to show out because the level of skill that these guys are going to bring, I really think is going to be unlike what Ducks observers fans have seen in a long time from the younger players, because these guys are at a entirely different level. Yeah. Uh, I remember the. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 go for it. Um, no, I was going to just simply say, I wonder what the Ducks are going to do with training camp in terms of if they're going to try to stream it. Um, obviously, if training camp happens, I mean, it It sounds like the NHL's targeting a January 1 start is still what, what I'm seeing. So if that happens and the Ducks are supposedly 
along with other teams that weren't in the playoffs going to get an extended training camp is, is also what has been stated uh, by, I be- believe Bill Daly said that. Um, it's got to be so we, coming we up. We may get a longer look. It may yeah. be coming up soon in, in, in early December is when training camp may begin. And if that's the case, if you're the Ducks, you got to look to stream this, right? Like I think that, I think they'll do something like that. There's, I mean, people aren't going to be allowed in the rink. We, I think we can pretty much guarantee that, that people aren't going to be allowed Unlikely. in the rink for training camp. And Unlikely. so with that being the case, you got to think about a way to engage a fan base. I mean, this is now me, obviously, like I was doing before, thinking out loud. But this yes, is this is there have been no games. There's been no Ducks actual on ice content since March. <laughs> since some boring ass games in March. <laughs> yes. So with that being uh, the case, yeah. you got to think that if you're the Ducks, you're looking for a way to engage the fan base. And part of that I think is going to have to be streaming streaming training camp in some way, some fashion. They, they would they would be crazy not to. Yeah, they would be crazy not to. So I think they will. Um, but that's. All I'm saying here is just that these guys, I think, are going to really impress because, A, they've had so much time to train. They've also had no real competitive outlet. And I think when you inject them into this setting, it's it's going to get interesting out there. So excited for that. Thank you for bringing that up, the, mm-hmm. the, the streaming. And now I'm hoping that it happens. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. That's what I'm here for with these thoughts out loud. I just come up with random yes. things, bring them up. It, 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 which it, it, it's it's the variable that we need the ex- unknown variable exactly i'm the wild card here right yeah you are you are um <laughs> all right okay i think did we, did we have another question something else oh we we have plenty of, we have plenty of questions so the wild card um the Brandon wild tracy also has a jersey number on here okay yeah, i'm done interesting Sorry. Charles or Charlie Meredith says, and speaking of wild card, the wild card for the Ducks, and this is more of a comment, but then a question. But wanted to read it and get your thoughts. The wild card for the Ducks might be Lundestrom and Larson, your favorite, um, who seem to be playing really well in Europe. Folks were surprised Larson was extended in the off season and may turn into a player yet. Same with Lundestrom, who seems to have discovered some confidence in the offensive zone. So, have you been paying attention to them in Europe that much? Let me ask you that straight up. No, I haven't, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not going to look at, especially especially Jacob Larson's results in the Alsvenskan, I'm not going to read into those at all. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's, it's it's not even the SHL, and not, not to discredit what he's doing or, or the level of that league, but I'm judging Jacob Larson now by what he does in the NHL because that's what he is at this point. He's an NHLer to some degree. Uh, with Isaac Lindstrom, Maybe I'll go back and watch. I have been watching a bit of his game tape from last year for different reasons. And I, I, of course, if Isaac Lindstrom could become some to some level what we thought he could be when he was drafted by the Ducks, then yes, that, that that's a big X factor for Anaheim. But there's a lot that needs to go right there with Isaac Lindstrom. And the same can be said for Jacob Larson. Now, the benefit for Jacob Larson is that the bar is so very low for him. I mean, it almost couldn't be any lower that if he's any level of res- of respectable in his own zone, moving the puck. Yeah, that's a big benefit for the Ducks, because all of a sudden your third pairing looks a lot better. Yeah. And I don't know how much he'll play next year because now there's more competition for that third pairing. But um, yeah, that is a that is an X factor because of how bad he was. And one thing to note, uh, Isaac Lundstrom playing the hockey Alvenskin or er, in uh Sweden right now, so it's one one level below the SHL, I believe, is what that is at. Um, it's their AHL. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he currently has 11 points in 11 games. So a little bit better than what yeah. he did in the AHL last year. Now, granted, lower level, so maybe that's what you would expect. But hopefully that's, a si- hopefully that's a <laughs> yeah. sign that he's found his game. He's also just a little older now, a little more polished, a little more developed. You would, you would expect him to be doing well in a league like that. And mm-hmm. – uh, we just now have to see once he comes back over, whenever the heck that's going to be, is he going to be able to bring any semblance of that? It, uh, let's not discredit what he's done, but let's let's be a little cautious here, not not go too crazy. Yeah. And so let's move on to another question. So we got this one from uh, our good friend Bonnie at Literate Gal on Twitter. Yes. Sent us a bunch of stuff. I'll read it all out, Bonnie. <laughs> I love you. I don't really have an answer for some of these, though. Uh Sorry about that, Bonnie. But she said the temperature and these are about questions. These are all questions. The temperature of the ice when players start struggling with the puck and their blades. So what temperature do you think it is at? 
Uh, the phys or the psychological impact of cheering. This is actually, I think, one that's somewhat interesting. The psychological inter impact of cheering versus piped in fan noise. The brotherhood created versus lost because of COVID, and the price of putting faith in baby ducks. Um, and she also wanted to know why. Why does Jake hate Adam Henrique? That is a good question. Why do you always want to trade him? I feel like every <sighs> every podcast we record, that's, you trade that, Adam Henrique. That's what you're keying in on here. That that's what you're gonna key in on here. There's a lot. There's a lot to go off of there. Uh, let's just let's just go down. Let's just go down the list because there is so temperature of the ice. Yeah, if it's warmer in a rink, the, the ice is gonna be stickier. The puck is gonna bounce more, and that can be frustrating for players, and especially for high level players. I think it actually matters more because they're so good and they want things to be a certain way. And so that can be annoying for them. But I think that that's kind of all it is. Great players are still going to make great plays. They're still going to stand out. Um, going further down the list. Psychological impact of cheering versus piped in fan noise. I think there's probably some psychological impact in the sense of getting up for mm -hmm. a game is probably a little bit tougher because you don't have that buzz. But I feel like once the game starts. I have you... a theory actually on the the cheering i think that without the the actual fan cheering um players might be less tempted to make more of a home run style play or go for the big hit and take themselves out of position or go for the highlight reel move right to and i'm not saying that the guys are doing that for the oohs and the ahs but you do get a rush when you complete a play yeah. like that and the crowd goes wild so maybe guys are a little more conservative we we didn't really see that in the bubble we saw that early in the in the um the round robin games, things of that nature, right? We saw some energy, but that that kind of faded, and guys were really locked in just to the game plan. So I, that may be an effect. Of course, this is really reading far into it. I have no clue if that's actually true or not. Uh, uh, something the I'm Brotherhood. Trying, something I'm trying to remember, and, and uh -huh. I can't yes. really remember off the top of my head on this. Yes. Was there piped-in fan noise, or was it just quiet yes. and they had— There was. I thought the fan noise was only done on the broadcast. No, there was piped in fan noise. Okay, fair enough. I, maybe maybe not in both bubbles, but I know definitely in the Western bubble, okay. and I would assume in the Eastern bubble. Okay. Um, Brotherhood created versus lost because of COVID. Well, <laughs> because of how much these athletes are testing positive for COVID, I don't think they're losing out on any Brotherhood. Well, I, I think they're and, I think they're out about. <laughs> and and I think the Brotherhood of it, if we're talking about the guys that were in the in the bubble. Those guys were probably probably even tighter than usual because they were stuck, or maybe they they became less tight because they had to spend every well, single waking minute at, with uh, each other. Look at how happy the Lightning looked when they won. Yeah, they, they, those look that looked like a pretty strong bond to me. Yep. And uh, is there a price yeah. of putting your faith in the baby ducks? I mean, to me, that's what the ducks have to do. You, you yeah, at this point, you got to live and die by them, right? There's a huge price. <laughs> There's, There's a huge, a huge risk. Price. Yeah, I mean that's the price. Is that if what you're what you're paying with is hey we're gonna go with these cheaper guys right, and the guys that we've developed and hope that they can perform to a level that's gonna elevate this team with certain elements of the roster on the on the wrong side of the aging curve. And so you're putting a lot of faith. And the price of that is if it succeeds, then great you you're a playoff team or you're much closer to that. If it fails, well then if it can fail epically and i think that the, the the price of that is how does that affect their confidence how does that affect the confidence of the organization in in the crop overall there there is a pretty pretty big downside risk and anyone who spends any time looking at the analytics of these players from last season it might not be the best bet to make that all of these guys are going to take a big jump i think the only young player that you can say right now is going to be a solid NHL or next year's Troy Terry. That's really the only one. Thank you. Thank it's you really for the saying only that. One. that. Well, it's just a fact. I mean, look I mean at, correct. Look correct. At, I know. I, I know it's Max, a fact. Look at Max Contois, for example. Great offensive player. I, I do think he's he has some, some uh, gifts offensively. But defensively, he's still learning how to do that. If you watch him play, you you quickly find out that there's some big holes in his game. For Sam Steele, Sam Steele does some things well. He's a good passer, right? He's got a good vision on the power play, but anything at five-on-five five right now is a struggle for him. Max Jones, 
Max Jones is trending towards bottom six territory, and that's fine, but that's... I don't know what really placing your faith in Max Jones even means anymore because he's just kind of trending as a support type player. And then on the on the blue line, you don't really... I, I guess you're putting your faith in Jacob Larson. Do you put him into that kid group? I, I don't really know. I so, don't know. yeah, you're putting your faith in all of that. So, enjoy. <laughs> yep. And, and that's it. There, there's no other question that Bonnie said, right? Uh, No. Why do you hate Adam Henrique? Oh, oh, that one. No, I. being serious, I don't I hate Adam Henrique. I don't. He was the you, best. You want, him, you want him gone. He. I said this many times, and I'll say it again. He was the best Ducks forward last season in terms of on-ice impact. He was the very best Ducks forward last season. And that's not even a controversial thing to say. And the reason why, though, I continually put him in my trade column is the fact that his deal is not fantastic. The fact that he (laughs) was the best Duck last season means he has some of the most value. And right (laughs) now, his value is the highest or at the highest it will ever be before it starts coming down as he starts aging. And that's not really controversial either. And so it's not that I hate Henrik. It is simply a value assessment proposition type of deal of viewing his value as going to diminish. And so you take, and the Ducks are not going to take advantage of that value with him on the team because, I mean, we've said it, the likelihood of them being a contender for the cup is not high. So why not use that value to get something that will help you when you are contending? What Bonnie dislikes is that you're just viewing him as a, a name on a spreadsheet, just a, a piece to be moved, and you're not valuing the human element. Shame on you for that. Truly, shame on you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all this right. was all tongue-in-cheek, by the way. Just just to make it very clear, we're, we're, we're being tongue-in-cheek. Um, we, wh- we, wh- we? One thing I didn't we? want to add on at one thing... <laughs> One thing I did want to add on Adam Henrique is that was he the Ducks' best player last year? It was a question, more of a. I think Cam Fowler was better. I think Cam Fowler was better. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Debatable. Debatable. But oh, yeah. definitely yeah. Deba- debatable. H- hugely debatable. Maybe. Yeah. It- it's it's probably one of those two. If you're gonna pick one. Yeah. Okay. So Sean Seabolt asks this question. Um, I feel like you guys talk about how bad the Theodore trade was, which. We do, and plenty of is. people do. Um, is. is is, but could you maybe go over the Pedersen trade slash trade tree? Is Juice better? Curious to hear your thoughts. So first off, let's run through this real quick, and uh, just the trade tree. It it's simple. It has two branches to it. It was uh, Marcus Pedersen traded for Christian Juice, and then or sorry, Mark and Pe- Marcus Pedersen traded for Daniel Sprong, and then Daniel Sprong eventually traded uh, for Christian Juice. So that's your tree right there. So essentially, at the end of the day, Daniel Sprong's just kind of in the middle of it, but it essentially becomes Marcus Pedersen for Christian Juice. I mean, it's it's kind of that simple because you have two defensemen going for one another, and there's a, a pretty easy comparable to make there. So now up on your screen, actually, pretty simply, we've gone over these RAPM charts, and so there's a nice easy way to kind of be able to compare them. You can see on the left-hand side, this is now even strength. You can now see Marcus Pedersen. Marcus Pedersen, pretty good. All situations, actually better at driving offense than he is at at limiting shots against and chances against. Uh, Christian Juice, also similarly, very good at driving shots and and chances, or not very good, but good at driving shots and chances towards the other team's net. The only kind of negative about him is limiting uh, chances against. This is over the last three years. Um, If we isolate it to our last single season, you can see they're, they're pretty similar. And so maybe you lost a little bit of value, but it's not significant. And I think that that's my key thing here. Um, I would say it's a little higher than, than a little value. I think that Marcus Pedersen right now is a better player than Christian juice. Okay. Christian juice was out of the lineup in Washington for almost a whole year. And the only reason he got NHL games to finish out the season was because he got traded. So, that's never a great sign. It doesn't mean that the team is right for doing that, but it's it's not something that you want. Christian Juice is also a little older. Marcus Pedersen has had really good uh, underlying numbers in Pittsburgh, and so I think Pedersen is still probably the better player in all of this mix. The best player of the three is Daniel Sprunk, and for whatever reason, he just can't stick anywhere, which is really unfortunate, but... How do I view it now? It's definitely not in the Shea Theodore realm. 
in terms of bad trades by any means that there may be some value lost here and there, but it's not bad. I think that at the time when the Ducks traded Pedersen, he was he wasn't really standing out both for either for good or for bad. He was just kind of a fine defensive prospect, third pairing guy, maybe up to second pairing. And, and that's kind of still what he is. Maybe he's trending a little further up that. They traded him for Daniel Sprong at a time where they needed to take flyers on potential forward talent. And the Ducks gave Daniel Sprong a chance in his first season. And then and he performed well under those circumstances. And then as soon as Dallas Akins got there, something just didn't click between those two because Daniel Sprong didn't make the Ducks out of training camp, got very limited action, and was traded to Washington at the trade deadline. So they get they got Christian Juice in return, who has his qualities as a player. I, I, I like the offense he brings from the blue line. I haven't seen enough of him to really make a judgment just from my own eye test, but the numbers indicate that he is kind of an offensive defenseman. So the move in all of this for me would have just have, would have just been to play Daniel Sprong, but we can't have nice things, right? I mean, yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, so we have two more questions to get to, and then we'll get to the Twitch chat. So hold your questions in the Twitch chat. We'll get to those after these. Um, we've answered this in, in various different situations, but we can just very quickly go through it. Vikingstad uh, at Hockey Rock uh, Beer asks, I'd like to know if you can guess at what the top six is going to look like. So, I mean, I think a couple episodes we did our, our line projection, but basically it would our our top six was, uh, if we're talking about a group, it was Raquel, Getzloff, Terry, Henrique, Silverberg, and then who was the left wing that we decided for? Heinen? I don't Heinen or I, No, Kompla. I think it was Sprong. Or maybe it was Comtois. Sprong. St- uh, t- uh, Milano. <laughs> Milano. Milano. There we <laughs> okay. go. Milano. Here, I'll give you my Frankenstein top six right now. Go for it. I think the best first line you can make right now for the Ducks is Raquel, Henrique, Terry. Okay. Ag- agree or disagree? I think Getzloff over Henrique, but sure. I think Henrique's a better player right now. Potentially. Different. I don't think he works Th- as well with that line. My issue with Getzloff is his defensive game has really Getzloff's taken a, a big... Getzloff's a better distributor, so I think with Raquel, Henrique doesn't really mesh as well. Especially, I mean, maybe it works because Terry is also a little bit of a distributor, so you have a trigger man for Terry, um, and Terry's the the guy that's going to distribute the puck uh, as compared to Henrique on that line, because that's the thing with yeah. Adam Henrique is he's Henrique not going to be the one not... to distribute the puck. He's not. He's not. But he is a good trigger man. And with Terry, I think Terry's a very good playmaker. Yes. And he's he, and he's also a really good carrier of the puck through the neutral zone, which is kind of something that Brian Getzlaff isn't at this point in his career. Fair enough. And and so and I think with Getzlaff, he just ne- he just can't be playing those high leverage minutes anymore. I think that that for better or for worse, that you just have to get him down in the lineup just to kind of get him some softer matchups, let him feast a little bit with his playmaking. But I think if he's going to be the center of the other team's defensive game plan, um, that's just not a good spot for, for either party in that mix. So I don't love putting Adam Henrique as your first line center. I'm not saying that that's the ideal world, but that's, that's the hand that we're dealt here. And then for my second line, do you want to hear something just, just insane? Oh, I remember who we had on the left wing. Sorry, real quick. It was Trevor Zegras. Okay. Yes, we yes. had Zegras, well, I, Zegras, Henrique, Silverberg was what we had. So th- I, that was I, our that was our top six previously was uh, a mix of Raquel, Getzloff, Terry, uh, Henrique, mm-hmm. Silverberg, Zegras. I, I don't have him in there just because. Fair enough. Wait, wait and see. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no idea how he's going to do. But my 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 just kind of out of this world, just shock value maybe second line, left wing Danton Heinen, right wing Jakob Silverberg, center David Backus. <laughs> <laughs> this line gets you the high, the second highest projected war of any forward combination among the Ducks. So this is just purely going off of stats. I'm not saying that that's I, the I, I feel like my face right now is that meme face of the guy just kind of blinking his eyes a bunch. Like, okay. This ha- So this line has a negative offensive war, but a, the highest defensive war of any line on the Ducks in my projected Fair enough. War. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, I mean I would, that that's a line that that would be a line where if you want to have a shutdown type of line, that would be it. I think that that would be an interesting third line in yes. an ideal world. <laughs> but this is obviously not an ideal world. The Ducks don't have center depth that maybe could have been avoided. So 
probably I would have um, Sam Steele between Silverberg and Heinen. And then on your third line, I mean, I don't know, I'm going down a third, but Contois with Getzlaff and Milano. Just have a, kind of an all-offense third line. Because mm-hmm. I, I think Contois, because I think a, some people might have Contois with Getzlaff and Milano as the second line. And I just think that that line could be so bad defensively that it just wouldn't work. I think that's one of the reasons the Ducks have struggled so much at five on five in recent years is because some of the guys that they count on in those bigger minutes just aren't good in their own end right now. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. I, I think that was definitely a very different way of imagining the, the top six. But I mean, yeah, it makes, hey, I, you, I feel you've been, you have been. Wait, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> Which one of us is going to get our accusation out first? You have been playing around with that war tool a whole lot from J, J Fresh Hockey and have, I bet, probably come up with all of the different uh, variations that you could for that top six or the the lineup that would create the best uh, war. And yes. so I fully trust that this is the line, their lineup, that would have the best war per his tool. So I have been spending too much time <laughs> just looking at stats, reading stuff. I, I'm This is good, though, because once the hockey starts again, I think I'm actually going to be better for it. So. Neither here nor there, uh, but I am just look. I'm just trying to replicate your your wild card element. That that's all I'm doing here. Fair enough. I'm just follow. I'm just following your lead. You're you're, you're an inspiration to us Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm happy that I'm your inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> you brought that upon yourself. All right. Move on. <laughs> Justin Beck on Twitter in a DM to me asked this, and I want to get to it. Topic for tonight, if you guys get a chance. Best and worst goal horn slash song in the NHL. Um, and did you guys like the old duck's horn with the siren or how it is now with siren? So to be completely honest, I don't have a great opinion on horns on the actual go horn. How dare you? I I just, I don't, I mean, the only thing that I know is the Kings have that train horn and I really don't like it, but that's also because any, but that's because when it happens, that, that means the King scored. And and so I'm biased against that, uh, without a doubt, but I do have opinions on goal song. Okay, well, let me give you my my horn horn talk, late night horn talk here. Um, Crash the so pond after the, dark right now. <laughs> so for the for the ducks goal horn, I actually prefer it without the sirens. I think the sirens are unnecessary and annoying. That the the, the fog horn is fine. My least favorite horn is the buffalo sabers. This is just for me going over different goal horns on YouTube, and the buffalo sabers. It's kind of like the the ducks where it's a foghorn, but it doesn't last as long in terms of the actual horn. It's kind of like a shorter horn, and then it goes again. And that loop lasts what feels like five minutes. It just keeps going, keeps going. And in my head, I'm just, you know, okay, we get it. The goal was scored. Good. Celebrate. But we don't need this just forever, right? Infinite loop. So Buffalo gets uh, the lowest marks for me Mm -hmm. in that regard. Real quick, before we get to goal songs. The only other thing that really happens um, with uh, in terms of goals that, that's very different is Columbus shooting the cannon. What are your thoughts on the cannon? I So I'm of two minds. I like the fact that they are trying to do something different and unique because the NHL needs more of that. They, you, you need teams to have more of their own local flavor. But personally, I hate it. I, I think it's... Wow. Just, it's just, just, just going for it. All right. So let's just really quick. I love because, I mean, I don't think we need to go through all of them, but let's do some best and worst. I love Bro Him being the Ducks goal song. I've been a big fan of it it's, since the very beginning. It's uh, good. It's, it's got a nostalgia element now. It does. And, and it's pretty much locked in. I mean, at one point in time, the Flyers tried to use it. And to me, it just felt wrong seeing it anywhere else outside of Honda Center. So I like it. It's a good goal song. Um, the two other goal songs that I really love one of them is mainly because it's just so not, I I feel like hockey is very, maybe this is just because of being uh, a child of the nineties and kind of watching how really started to get into hockey in depth in the mid to late two thousands. But it's very much to me, a hard rock sport. And a lot of these are are hard rock songs. That's kind of more so what I associate with hockey and so the fact that the Toronto Maple Leafs use "You Make My Dreams" by Hollow Notes makes me laugh yeah. every time, and I it's love good. it. I love it to it's death. Good, because it's just it, yeah. so different. I hate it because it's the Leafs, but I do like the choice. It, yeah. It's it's just you hear that, and it's just like this makes me want to get up and move. 
I, I just hate that the Leafs can have all these cool things <laughs> and no one else can, it seems. Well, they don't have any wins against the Bruins in the first round, but outside of that, they haven't made there, it. So. There's your Canadian bias. But great goal song. Other one that I want to say is a great goal song, and maybe this is just me liking things different and not liking status quo, which is pretty on brand for me, um, is the Buffalo Sabres using Let Me Clear My Throat by DJ Cool. It's, yeah, it's it's it, not great. What? Well, I just the whole Buffalo setup. I guess I'm. I the thing is, you have to go through the horn to get to that. But and, it's, uh, it's just the, the horn... you you hear the Let Me Clear My Throat and then the beat drop, and it's just like, oh, okay. it's so good. Well, maybe uh, I mean, who knows? We should go to a Buffalo game one day and watch Taylor Hall and Jack Eichel do their thing if we ever can. <laughs> yeah, that team's gonna be fun. That I, team I don't is... think they're gonna be. I don't think they're going to be good, but they're going to be fun. All right. And give me your your best, and then we'll get to worst. And then I actually have a wild card um, here to see. I want to get your is, thoughts. Best is Canadians, Montreal Canadiens, obviously. I don't think I need to go into detail, but I will. They've had the same horn for as long as I've been a fan, which is a long time now. It's it's that kind of – I don't even know what to describe it, but it's, it's a unique horn. Very, very good horn. Um, and the song – the song has changed over the years, but it's always good. It always means good things that are, are happening in my life if that song's going off. So given the Habs, the number one there. Okay. No bias at all. No bias whatsoever. This is why I said the Ducks was very good, so I didn't have to rank it in the like top category. I could just, I'm just take I'm, I'm just, take out my bias. Hey, it's our podcast. I'm I'm gonna be biased if I want. Fine. It doesn't matter. Fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Keep, keep going. No, that's it. That, oh, that was that, your best? That's um, my best. <laughs> what what is the worst in your opinion? I said Buffalo. Yeah, I mean it's. Oh, it's okay. Buffalo. Okay. The, I thought we're talking about horns. You change it to songs. No, it so said horns song. slash songs. It was both. Where it was in the question. Honestly, I know that people love it because it's kind of nostalgic. But the is it Zombie Nation? Yeah. For King, Bruins. Yep. Yeah, I agree. That was what Kirk I was going to go with. I'm just sick of hearing that because, of course, I hate the Bruins. I, the Boston fans tend to get you know get on my nerves. And just I know that when I'm hearing that, a bad thing has just happened. And I'm just sick of hearing it. They've had it for, they've had it for probably over 15 years now. So, yeah, I'm, I'm over it. Change, please. All right. Let me ask you this. What's your thoughts on player-specific goal songs? I would love that. I would absolutely love there, that. The yeah, Capitals, I, I guess, did that this past year. It was handpicked oh, really? by each, and I know I think Vancouver did it for a couple years. See, I think that's cool. I, I mean, I'm I'm fine with it either way. I think that it's kind of cool for there to be a team goal song and for the fans to be able to kind of know it by heart and rally around it. But I also think that if there's a different chant or a different song for each player, that kind of gives another element for the fans to kind of you know well, memorize. It, like, okay, it, we got to know that. We got to know the Raquel song or the it, Getzlaff song, right? It feels very European soccer to me because, I mean, yes, you, you, you look does. at European, the Premier League, I, as a Tottenham fan, so many of the players have songs about them that will be sung when they, they score or they do something. And it's just, yeah. you you know that song for that player. And it's... Engage the fans. Yeah, and it's so much fun. I've been to, I went to one game when I was in, or two games when I was in England, and it's so much fun when you see that player do something and everyone starts singing his song. And mm-hmm. that's, I think, what this would be. And it would be really cool. And you have, you could have a team specific song if it's not clear. Or maybe what you do is you start wind, with their song, or you, song. And, you, and you transition. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, Ken Pafu said, Ooh, Ah, Silverberg. That song, they could yeah. create an actual song version of it and play it whenever he yeah. scored. Like, picture that. People say, chant that anyways. Go with it. Right. Right. Well, no, I, I think it's great. I think it's a fantastic idea. I mean, in baseball, you have walk-up songs. So, yeah. And I think that that has its own kind of fun dynamic. So why not? Why the hell not? Yeah, Make it ex- more fun. Exactly. So This is, inter- actually, this is entertainment. I actually want to point this out. but So I was playing NHL 20 for a bit before I purchased NHL 21. And I didn't realize, but they have this thing now where they have Snoop Dogg commentating in the game. Do they really? They do. That is amazing. And, uh, <laughs> and there's one part where they ask him in this kind of you know staged interview, what would you do to make the games more fun, the the in-game experience? And 
he actually says make it more about the fans. So yeah, do stuff like that that engages the fans more. I mean, why not? We we all if, need to remember. If Snoop Dogg says it, it must be true, right? We all need to remember this, and I think we try to really hone in on this at various points in time. This is all about entertainment at the end of the day. Yeah, like the line between pro wrestling and other sports is a fake line. I mean, they even sh- though, even though, yes, I understand that, and I and I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to equate what the the businesses are doing or what the franchises are doing, but to, to pro wrestling, but the whole, it all boils down to entertaining people with what's going on, on your field, ice court, whatever. And it has to be fun for people to show up because those are the people that are going to come back, that are going to buy jerseys, that are going to place bets, that are going to get season tickets. So you have to make it fun. And I think that getting bogged down in the, the traditions of it and trying to keep it, to, to, in a certain way that that's not beneficial in the long run. No, nope. as a wrestling fan, I can say watching all this, the, the worst wrestling gets it right. Wrestling. The... Well, not only does wrestling get it right, but mm-hmm. wrestling gets it wrong at various points in time because they get so bogged down in some people trying to think it needs to be traditionally the, the way it was yeah. and not wanting to adapt to the, but to, that's what made it what it, what it is now. Well, and there's, and that is the reason why AEW has come up is WWE had this formula and now AEW is there to give something different and, and provide and, entertainment and adjust to what the new audience wants. Well, how do you feel about a few years back? There was this, uh, there was a game. I don't know if the NHL did this, but the NBA, the New York Knicks, they did a game or it was a half where there was no music no in-game entertainment it was just they did it was like a throwback night and they had just nothing playing for a half and some people thought it was great some people thought it was creepy how do you feel about something like that i'm all for trying different things Uh uh-huh i feel like that's yeah that that's the opposite way that you should be trying things though well long term yeah you you won't want to do that but the idea is i don't think you want it to be full-on minor league baseball level kind of corny right and I'm not trying to bash what those leagues do because just bash they have them right now. They have a different business model. They need to get people in there each and every game, and they have to do whatever they can to do that. But I do think you could you could borrow from that a little bit, right? Have those kind of fun, wacky theme nights. And I think the NHL is doing a lot more of that. But go go full full in. Why not? Yeah. So all right. So let's get into some questions from our Twitch chat now. Um, so for those of you watching the YouTube version, yes, we have a show. We put the, the video of this on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash crash the pond. Find us there. Find our videos. Like and subscribe. If you subscribe and hit that bell, you'll get notified anytime um, our videos drop. They'll be dropping either Sunday night or Monday morning, typically, uh, when we do our Sunday shows. Um, and if you're watching or if you're listening to this on the podcast, so we do a Twitch stream each and every time you can find us at twitch.tv slash crash the pond where you can subscribe to the show in a way that's completely free to you and it helps us out significantly. If you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime sub each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days. Um, you can also follow us, uh, and that is completely free to you, and you'll get notified whenever our video, videos go live. If you do subscribe, you get special emotes, emotes in the chat, special badge next to your name, and like I said earlier, it helps support us more than you can imagine. So Kempafu asks us, since Shea Theodore was brought up, how do Jamie Drysdale and Shea Theodore compare at their draft minus one year? Um, I'm assuming, Ooh. Choney, you probably mean their draft year, not necessarily just their draft minus one. But so I'm looking at um, our, our good friend Byron Bader's hockey prospecting tools for this right now. And we've talked about in the past how the the tool is really good for forwards, but it's hard to necessarily utilize for defensemen because it, it's so point reliant. But the issue that we have is both Shea Theodore and Jamie Drysdale are kind of known as being offensive defensemen. They played in different leagues with Shea Theodore being in the WHL and Jamie Drysdale being in the OHL. But if we were to simply look at their uh, star probability and NHL probability in their draft season, so their their actual draft year, um, Jamie Drysdale projected higher. And that makes sense. Jamie Drysdale was a top 10 pick. Shea Theodore was, oh, I forget the exact pick, actually, uh, 26th overall. And mm-hmm. so Shea Theodore has a, has a higher uh, NHL probability, higher star probability. Part of that, uh, so it, it his draft profile wasn't necessarily just because he was a right-handed shot defenseman um, that was the smooth skater. It was also because he was that good at various points in time. Yeah, I mean, Jamie, 
that's just the thing that I was talking about earlier is that we have become so accustomed to the the last few years of Ducks prospects and that there's this, you know, slower approach and we can't expect too much. And I I'm not saying that all of a sudden we have to expect the world from these newer draft choices, but this is a different caliber now. The the Zegras, Perot, Drysdale, especially Zegras and Drysdale, it's going to be a different caliber than what we've seen the last few years. Yeah. And so Tony also asks asks with a, uh, a question right afterwards. We always hear about the Ducks' ability to develop defense, uh, the defenseman very well. Is their offensive development uh, in the system bad? Thinking about recent forwards that the Ducks drafted, the only two that come to mind without research are Carlson and Paul Mary. But I'm wondering if they uh, they just had the offensive talent without the Ducks doing much to help them. So do you think there's an issue with the development? Because we look at the Ducks' uh, system and you look at the defenseman they've turned out. And even when we mm-hmm. had Byron on the show, he even mentioned this, that they've developed a whole lot of star-quality defensemen but there really haven't been that many star quality forwards. Do you think it's a, a yep. talent issue? Do you think it's a development issue? I have my thoughts, but I want to get yours first. Um, I think it's a talent issue. If you look at the players that the, and I'm not saying that it's there, there's no element of development, but if you look at the forwards that the ducks have draft drafted in the last few years, there's very few guys that were really profiled as, as kind of high ceiling forwards and and guys who could put up points in the NHL. I mean, go back to, I mean, this is the one that people are are really going to be seething about for a long time, but 2014, right? You take Nick Ritchie at 10th overall. That's not really a high ceiling type pick. And then you just go on down the line. The Ducks drafted Julius Natanen in the second round, right? In 2015, not exactly uh, a swing for the fences there. 2016, you take Max Jones and Sam Steele at 24 and 30. And you kind of see how that's played out. Maybe Sam Steele does hit that ceiling, but it, it's not looking it's not looking incredibly likely. And they did they did try for some guys in that 16 draft. Alex Dosti in the fourth round, Tyler Soy in the seventh round. Those are actually guys that I kind of liked at, at different points, but hasn't really panned out. And then since then, I mean, Max Contois in, in 2017, Bo Grew, Isaac Lindstrom, you know, there just hasn't been a lot of those kind of guys that they've drafted. They just haven't been targeting high end forwards or high kind of skill oriented mm-hmm. forwards. And some of these guys that I just listed, probably a chunk of them are going to become good NHLers, but those are guys who can come in to supplement the stars yeah. that you have on your roster. You need the stars first. And yeah. that's what the Ducks haven't been drafting up front. Yeah. And, and my thoughts on this are, are basically the fact that I don't think there's necessarily a. Uh, an issue with developing talent. I think the issue that's happened is outside of well, Nick I Ritchie. I think the Ducks are good at developing talent. Exactly. Outside of Nick Ritchie, they haven't, like you said, they haven't taken really any forward with a high first round pick. I mean, you have defense. They, they've they now taken, I mean, they've taken Jamie Drysdale. Obviously, now they took Trevor Zegras last year, but before those guys, um, and obviously Zegras being a forward, we'll see how that plays out, and that may change this conversation completely. But outside of those, the high, the high picks that they had were Nick Ritchie, Cam Fowler relatively high also at 12th overall and uh, Hampus Lindholm at sixth overall. And so two of those three are defensemen. And I mean, Nick Ritchie didn't become a star, but he became an NHLer. So I I think that it's not necessarily an issue with development. I think you, you see them also, they they've hit with some late, late round picks with uh, defensemen with, for instance, Marcus Pedersen becoming a decent NHLer, Josh Manson Manson becoming a, a pretty, pretty darn good NHLer. Uh, Josh Mahura, second round, I believe a second round pick potentially coming in. Henry Thrun looking good, but in that same same uh, note, we can also say Andre They've Kasha. Done well with defensemen. Andre yeah. Kasha also like they they have late round picks that are forwards that have turned out. Ter- Troy Terry looks like he's going to be an NHLer, and, and getting that from a late round pick is, is important. So I don't necessarily think there's an issue development wise. It's more so just maybe it, it's a talent evaluation at the draft. Maybe it's a situation of they haven't prioritized getting a forward. Well, it's just the kind of player that they're targeting because a lot of people, I can hear people saying, well, you're, you know, you're judging this too soon or, or you're, or this is, you're kind of revising history because of how things have panned out. No, on draft day, for example, in 2018, I remember we all said Isaac Lindstrom doesn't profile as a kind of high level forward in the nhl in terms of point production he's going to be a guy who could be solid bottom six and i mean that's kind of what we're seeing so far and 
you just go down the list. And I think that that that's held true. And people will, will also say, well, what are you supposed to do when you pick in the 20s? This is just what happens, right? Not necessarily. Look at who the Ducks drafted this year at 27, Jacob Perot. That's the kind of player that that is almost always available in the late 20s that teams just choose not to draft. This year, the Ducks finally decided, hey, let's let's take a swing on a guy. And you're really even at that point overrating how much of a downside risk there is because, sure, even if a guy might not be good defensively or might have some downside to his game, the only real downside is not shooting for upside. That's the only thing you can really do wrong. And so the more you consistently target these guys who at best are going to be bottom six, the more you're actually giving yourself more downside. So it's not about picking later and it's not about revisionist history. It's, these are just the facts. Yeah. Um, and Tony added on um, kind of piggybacking on his question um, with the fact that William Carlson because the fact that it took him until he was in Vegas to really explode. So was that an issue? Yeah. Was that an anomaly and he already had the talent? Um, or did the Blue Jackets do something better with, than the Ducks with their development? So I don't necessarily think that. I think what this was was he got to Vegas, he hit his prime years, he overproduced and had a high shooting percentage, and he's kind of maintained, not the high shooting percentage, he's maintained the, the quality play, but the shooting percentage has died back to probably where it is. And I think what we're really seeing is uh, is guys that, or is a guy that's in his prime production year starting to produce at his prime level. Yeah, well, the thing with William Carlson is it was also an, a matter of timing because when the Ducks were, you know, at that time where the Ducks made that trade, the Ducks were in win now mode and going out and, I don't know if was it was Newski or Rene Bork that they got for William Carlson. Was Newski. They traded Rene Bork with William Carlson. That's right. So you trade for a guy who you think can help put you over the top when you're already a really good team. And William Carlson was I don't want to call him a throw in in that deal, but Rene Bork was kind of the bigger piece at the time. And and William Carlson was an, I guess a nice prospect, a former second round pick, but he wasn't really thought of it of, in that way at all. And I think it's justifiable for the Ducks to have made that move because, again, like you just laid out, he didn't hit until he got to Vegas and had this massive opportunity that he wouldn't have had elsewhere. So, yeah, I th there's definitely things that you can criticize the Ducks on in, in terms of what they've done in the last decade. But the William Carlson trade is, I would argue, not one of them. No. Um, Ducks go asked, I complained about a month, uh, about this earlier in the month or so during draft day Anaheim never has prioritized at least in the last little bit, um, high scoring threats with its picks since Cam Fowler, we have drafted nonstop defensemen over forwards. Why is this? I would like to note, um, Trevor Zegras drafted last year. That, that was important. Yes. Um, right before Cam Fowler, they drafted Peter Holland and Kyle Palmieri in the first round. Um, it, it really seems as if Bob Murray and the Ducks system, especially when they've had later picks, um, they've kind of prioritized what they needed um, within the system, and they kind of went for that. So if they were heavy on defense, they kind of prioritized getting forwards. If they were heavy on forwards, they went for defense. We, we've seen that. And then when they've had a top 10 pick, it seems like they've kind of really looked at the best player available, at least. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that really feels like my read of the situation with the later picks best player available becomes a little bit more wishy-washy and more be, and you can really factor in need a little bit more with later first round picks, early first round picks. You really want to get your, your high end picks. So Cam Fowler, they took cause it, it was, he was a guy that, that slid to them. I mean, you look at Hampus Lindholm, another top pick for the ducks, uh, potentially you, you look at that draft. He's probably the best player from that draft. You potentially could be first overall. Maybe you make a case Morgan Riley, um, in terms of the guys taken in that top 10 or with the profile of that. So, they, these aren't bad picks that they've taken. Um, I, I think it, it's more so just what they've been prioritizing with those later first round picks at those times. So I don't, yeah. I, I don't really buy that they've prior, they haven't been prioritizing high scoring th threats. I think it's more so just the ebbs and flows of, of a prospect system. And I mean, you, it, it's hard to say that when you took Trev when they took Trevor Zegras last year. And, and now, granted, is, but but th but that's very recent. That yeah. is incredibly recent. One, one thing to note, and this is just uh, kind of a tangent here, but 2015 draft out of their one, two, three, four, five, six, seven picks, the Ducks have only had two of those guys play NHL games so far. 2015 draft. Yeah. That's that's a, that's not what you want. No, <laughs> no not at all. Um, anyway. 
so let me see oh we got this question and this is going to be one for me i think this will be the last question of the show because i don't think you're going to have any thoughts on it so we're going to end with this one it came from lewis and i bet you can imagine where it's going but lewis asked how about that aew pay-per-view yesterday so for those of you that don't know AEW Full Gear was yesterday. I was not able to watch it live. That's why you did not see tweets from me. Felix is now on his phone, not paying attention to me at all. So, and no, there's probably I'm, I'm listening. There, there's probably I'm a listening. fair amount of people that have no care about the the wrestling world. But you know what? I I get to give my brief review. You know, <laughs> this is the only place I get to give that review, so it's coming. Um, but it was a really really good show. Probably my favorite pay per view since Revolution. Which, funny enough. Revolution was the show you and I, I forced you to watch and we did a review of together. That was fun. God. That was fun. But it was. No, it was. This this was a really, really good show. It started off hot with Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page. Potentially the best match on the show. I mean the Young Bucks versus FTR, the storytelling in that match, the fact that uh Tully Blanchard was barred from ringside. And then you have FTR, their whole no flips, just fists situation and, and that whole gimmick that they're running. And the fact that uh, uh, Dash decided – Cash? I forget. I always get confused with them now they've come to AEW in terms of their names. Regardless, the fact that he now, without their their uh, manager out there, starts to try to go and do some flips, and that cost them the match. It was just great storytelling. Young Bucks now being champions feels great. It's all set up now for Kenny Omega to win the title, that lead to have all the title titles, and turn heel, and it's going to be great. And MJF now being part of the inner circle creates an interesting storyline there. It's just a lot of fun. The The final match wasn't completely my cup of tea with uh, the John Moxley, um, Eddie Kingston, I quit match, but it was good overall. And the show was great. Hukaru Shida, absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic also. So really good show. I highly suggest if anyone's looking to, to, to get back. If, there's a lot of people, I think, like me that, that watched wrestling during the Attitude Era, maybe post-Attitude Era, uh, grew out of it a little bit. There's some actually really fun storytelling going on in AEW. And if you want to get into wrestling, watch that. Don't watch WWE. Well, there you go. Do you have anything else you want to add, just in general? Um, Tottenham, anything else we missed? Tottenham was top of the table for a very little bit of time today. They, they won their match, and then Leicester eventually won, but um tottenham gareth bale is back it's amazing i have a bale jersey now i get to see gareth bale and harry kane on the pitch together i don't Correct. i don't know how to feel it it's just all the there they actually started harry kane young Min's son and gareth bale and yes the table tony is the the standings that's what the standings are called in the premier league the table they were top of the Correct. table for a little now they're second i believe so you know what? Good it seems like they're you. good. They're good in spite of Mourinho. And then the, the Chargers lost again. Yeah, you're you've been you've been standing for the Chargers. Pretty I mean, hard. I have a Chargers shirt and a Chargers hat. <laughs> Say no more. I know. Con- I know. Confirmed. Went fan. to a game at StubHub a couple years ago. Well, the Chargers are. They're not there. They're yet. They're fun. Entertainment's there. <laughs> I mean, it's also crushingly depressing. Good jerseys. Good jerseys. Crushingly depressing to, to watch their games and hope they win. US, <laughs> USC lucked out yesterday with uh, two touchdowns in the final three minutes of the game to win uh, with very sloppy football. So there we go. You're just, you're L- just LA, all over LA the LAFC map. drew. Uh, Diego Rossi won, <laughs> won the golden boot. You are all over the place. I'm informed. I'm informed. Y- you're, you're in form, definitely. I will say that. Um, I just want to point out, because it's it's kind of sinking in as you're talking, bringing uh-huh. up football. I was the third highest scoring team in my fantasy league this week, ten team, and I'm gonna lose. So, hate to see it. Wow. Hate 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 to see it. Wow. Good old fantasy football. You do everything right, and it, it might you might still lose. But now anyway. you're making me think that I should look at how my team's doing. Hey, I'm winning right now. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm in three leagues, and I'm winning in two out of the three. But the one that I really care about, I'm losing in. So. I mean. In my defense, I'm my team's awful this year. This will be my first win in weeks. You never talk about season long because you just don't care about it. Uh, I stopped caring once Saquon Barkley got hurt and screwed over my what? entire team. Once you started becoming a professional daily fantasy player? No, I am not. But once Saquon Barkley got hurt and my entire team went to hell because of it. I think that you that was survivable if you tried hard enough. But... I've I've tried. I have tried. 
<laughs> now I want to see your team. Anyway, this is getting way into the weeds. Um, should we wrap this thing up? Uh, I think it's about time. I think it's about time. It's about time. I would say so. So hopefully everyone enjoyed what we just, the last hour we went through that, that went by really fast. It, I feel like, uh, if people want to talk, talk to me more about AEW, tweet me. No. I have more thoughts. Yeah, you know, tweet him. Yes, yes. Tweet him. Tweet. Uh, or no, no, no. Here's the other thing. If you want to hear me talk about it more, ask the question. Felix, Felix <laughs> can't get around it if someone's asked the question. So thank you, Lewis. Correct. Thank you. Cor- correct. Yes. We will absolutely entertain the question if it's asked uh, through the Twitch stream. But um, if you enjoyed the show, if, uh, you know, as we wrap up here, there's a, f- a few ways that you can support us. Uh, one of them, we do have a Patreon page. Uh, there's two tiers where for a dollar a month, you can uh, have access to our patrons only discord chat. Once the season rolls around, that's where we have live in game chats. Uh, When there's ducks breaking news, major news, we will react in there. We kind of bounce ideas off each other. It's a, it's a fun little community. Uh, Highly recommend that. And obviously for a dollar, you're also, God, I need to stop. I'm really trying to work obviously out of my vocabulary or at least lower it because does it make, doesn't it, doesn't Bonnie. it make zero sense to say obviously before the thing has actually been said? Bonnie, if you're listening to this, please make a count of how many times you said it and send it to him. No, I, I've been trying. Tony, I've actually, I, I've been thinking about it throughout the show. To, so. Tony has said it's obviously not working. So saying <laughs> some saying something is obvious before it's been said just that just doesn't make sense, right? Anyway, so dollar a month, Discord chat, fun good times supporting your favorite show now for five dollars a month still get access to the chat but you also get access to two bonus episodes and those episodes are a lot of fun because we get to go really in depth into different topics there is a channel in the discord chat where you can submit your own suggestions and we we go all in on those and they're a lot of fun we also have a good degree of banter so if you enjoy the you know the final stages of our episodes here where we kind of go a little bit off the rails uh you get a lot more of that on the regular show we're a little more unfiltered uh so i would recommend that so that's five dollars a month helps us out tremendously um especially during these kind of tough times so then that's at patreon.com slash crash the pond now if you don't want to uh pay anything a month that's oh. completely understandable real quick i want to add new to the patreon we should we should promote this felix yeah new to the patreon we now have a new option where if you want to get a little bit of a discount i believe it's about 10 percent um you can subscribe for the whole year so instead of paying every month you can just pay all of it up front and get uh your 12 months that way i believe it comes out to about 54 dollars for the the five dollar tier uh where you get your two bonus episodes uh... so you'll be subscribed for a full year for a little bit cheaper um than if you were to do it at every month so you can go ahead if you're already a patron i believe you can go in and you can modify that for for next month to be charged uh the the amount for the year if you're gonna just, just want to keep it um for the entire year if you know you're going to do that or if you want to subscribe and get the whole year you can get a little bit cheaper could be a good christmas gift uh, holiday gift whichever holiday you celebrate because uh we're getting there jake it's it's almost that time of year or it is that time of year however you want to describe it uh but a free way to support us which does go a long way um you can leave us a review on apple Podcasts. just search for crash the pond or you can just leave us a rating either way it is really appreciated we actually got a review earlier this week which uh is the first one we've gotten in a while so we are definitely going to read it here on the show this one coming from surf plus hockey so nice little combination there two, Jake, two of sure my favorite things two of my favorite you'll, you'll, things do you even surf anymore, though? Uh, do, do you actually surf? I think I'm going to go on Saturday, next Saturday. So there you we go. You should, because you're going to lose your title. You're, the, the belt will be vacated. Um, to who? Just, I don't know. You, you can't be inactive for that long. Anyway, uh, fun and analytics is the title of this review, which, uh, yeah, those two things are possible. They can coexist. Five stars. Love the banter. Mixed with insightful analytics and opinions, Jake and Felix dig deep into the Ducks roster and have fun doing it. Thank you so much, Surf Plus Hockey. That is exactly what we are shooting for with this show, to inform you guys, to really give you a different perspective that you may not get elsewhere about this team, to give you a level of detail that I think, outside of maybe one other source, Eric Stevens, you're not really going to get about the Ducks. So we're, we're doing our best here. Really, thank you so so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you if you want to throw in your own two cents, guys, you can just search for Crash the Pond 
on Apple Podcasts. We're on all of your favorite uh, podcast platforms, though. We are on Spotify. We're also on YouTube, youtube.com slash Crash the Pond. So if you enjoy the podcast in video format, Jake will actually upload the Twitch stream to YouTube. So you get to see, you know, when we refer to charts and we pull those up in the stream, you actually get to see it there. So make sure you subscribe to our channel there and also get notifications turned on so that you always know when our show goes up. Although generally speaking, it's going to be either late Sunday evening or Monday morning. For the record, Um, for the record, mm -hmm. I've surfed more recently than the Ducks have played in a game. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> the Ducks haven't played. Exactly. You, you know, could, you could relevant. have done it once. Relevant, relevant, relevant. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I, I got you there a little bit. I, I think you're a little rattled. Maybe, um, maybe. I was thinking about <laughs> trying to trying to come up with a response that entire time, and that's the best I got. <laughs> okay. Um, where was I? So also, of course, if you do want to just check out our site, that's at crashthepond.com. We'll probably get some articles up there in the coming week. I think Jake has some things in the in the cooker you can find us on facebook there as well just search crash the pond we should and, so next mm-hmm. week we actually have a, a pretty fun show in the works yes so next week we are going to do a deep dive this is something where i hope everyone's kind of been thinking about this a little bit because we're less than a year away we're i don't know how many months but we're probably what seven eight months away from this the expansion draft next yeah. week we're gonna do a dive into the expansion draft rules come up with our protected lists, figure out what we think the Ducks will do with this expansion draft. Because there's a whole lot of unknowns, but this roster, now that it's it's looking like it's pretty pretty much set, I think we can agree maybe there's a trade incoming, maybe there's not. But I doubt. With, with this roster being pretty much set, we can try to look ahead to the expansion draft and what the Ducks are going to do. Yeah, no, that is... So good, good job to mention that, Jake, because we are going to dive deep into that. That is often something that people want to know about doesn't feel like that that long ago where we were having similar conversations and we're going to do it again. So buckle up everybody. That's going to be next Sunday. Uh, check us out on Twitter. Follow Jake. He's at reindeer games, 91. Follow him for all of the ducks commentary and other topics. Um, follow crash the pond, the actual site page at crash the pond. And I am on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard and quick plug. I mean, shameless self-promotion, do have an article going up at the fourth period this week going in depth on Max Contois' game. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hope you have a great week. Uh, feels like we're, I said this in the last pod, I'll say it again. 2020 is winding down. We're heading towards better days, hopefully. So with that being said, we will talk to you at the next show. Have a good one. Bye.